this uh, month has been devoted to, like our, our thing has been called Grow. So that's been our series, it's been called Grow. Uh, the idea is there's kind of a hodgepodge of stuff we're doing in July. Um, and so we, we want to bring it all together and say this is the, this is the focus that we're having. And the, the desire for us is that we would grow as a church this month, that we would take some steps forward. So here's some of the things that goes on this month. So we had Joseph preach earlier in this month. So one of City View's emphases is that we would be a church that plants 100 churches in 25 years. Joseph is our next guy who's going to go out and plant. He's going to be going in November. We're, we're pumped about that. He's going to be doing a great job, and he's celebrating today in Disney World. Um, so, you know, don't feel bad for him. Actually, he's driving there right now, so maybe you should feel bad for him. He's got three small kids in a car. Um, Joseph is going to be our next church planner to go out, and we're excited for that. We, we also have another guy who we're interviewing, kind of working with. He might be on board as soon as January. I can't tell you who he is yet, but he's tall. Uh, and I'm excited for that guy to come on board. I think God's going to do some big things through him as well. I think he's already orchestrating some stuff. Uh, then what well, we've done the, uh, the second, third, and next week is we've set it up so we have our elder candidates who are preaching. So you guys can uh, become familiar with who those people are. So you know who, who is going to help lead this church. Pastor Travis and I, we, we are the elders, the elders of this church right now. We are the pastors. We are looking to fill our team with three uh, lay pastors, or we'll call them elders. And what happens is these Five men, me, Travis, and these three men, if, if God so leads, uh, will help lead the church forward. And that's what I'm going to teach on today. I feel like uh, I've grown up in churches, and maybe you have too, where there's a couple different forms of government. And whether you know this or not, all churches have a government, okay? Uh, otherwise, they can't be churches. They don't get to be able to give 501c3 deductions anyway. Uh, the senior pastor is usually there's this thing where the senior pastor is essentially the CEO. The senior pastor is in charge of all the things, and the senior pastor word is law. Uh, you will do what the senior pastor says, and if you do not do what the senior pastor says, then you will be in big, 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 big trouble all the time. Then there's another form of government where there's the deacons run everything. Um, and, and the deacons, somehow they have this, this power grab around certain things, and they are the ones in control. And what we're going to say in terms of these things is those things aren't, I'm going to take a step back in case you want to throw something at me, uh, those things aren't biblical. Those things, as, as I've read, as we've looked, as we've studied, as we've looked at other churches and the models they have, that the most biblical form of church government is what we would call a plurality of elders. Now, if you've come from a church in that environment, and you've said, well, I've, I've, I grew up in a great church with a senior pastor who was the one in control all the time. I don't want to disparage that in any way. And if you've come from a great church where your deacons were wonderful men who helped lead the church, I don't want to disparage that in any way. What I want to do is say, what we're going to do is we're going to take what the Bible says as City View Church, and we're going we're to be as close to what the Scripture teaches us to be as possible. Does that make sense? I mean, isn't that what you would want in a church? Like, that we're going to take the Bible and say, all right, well, what's the Bible say to do? And then we're going to do what the Bible says rather than just come up with our own ideas. Like, hey, let's do this instead. So what we're going to do is today we're going to teach through what church leadership is about in terms of eldership. I want, to, I want to give you guys a good explanation of what it's about and why we're doing it this way. But first I want to talk about servanthood. If you have your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 20. It'll be on the screen here in a second as well. But Matthew chapter 20 lays out... Jesus' economy for how leadership happens within the local church. This is the way leadership happens within the local church. It's Matthew 20. You ready? We're going to read. In verse 25, it says this, But Jesus called them to him. These are the disciples. And said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. So, the people who lead the Gentiles, people who don't know the Lord, people who don't know God, that, that the leaders of the Gentiles, they lord it over the Gentiles. And their great ones exercise authority over them. So the ones who are great, they, 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 try to, they, they take the iron fist and pound it down and say, you will do what I say. Verse 26, 
It shall not be so among you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to disciples, believers in him, people who are trusting the Lord. It shall not be so among you. You won't lead like this. This is not the way it's going to happen in terms of my vision for the church and what I'm in charge of going forward. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here's your first blank on your handout if you're going to take notes. And it's very simple. You could probably fill it in on your own if you wanted to. It's just that leadership in church should be characterized by servanthood. When we talk about what it means to be a leader within a church, I cannot be a dictatorial, commanding person. Now, if you look at my, my personality profiles, uh, I, I, any, anybody Myers-Briggs, any, do the Myers-Briggs deal or disc profile, I have, an, I have an ENTJ personality on the Myers-Briggs, which uh, if you don't know what those letters mean, you shouldn't because it's weird. Uh, but I, I am compared to, this is awesome, um, Napoleon, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, and I think the other one was like Attila the Hun. So, so understand something. I'm convicted by these messages, all right? My, w- uh, on the disc profile, uh, I'm, I'm what's called a high D. Uh, somebody who administered the test for me said, uh, you have the highest D of anybody I've ever seen. And, I, and then they said, you know, do you know what the other letters mean? I said, I don't care. <laughs> um, D is for dominant. And here's the thing. This is, the, this is a thing that pushes against my personality. But here's what we need to understand when things push against our personality. Where's the sin nature inside of me? And what is the Lord convicting me of in the middle of that? Now, is it wrong for me to have those kind of personality traits that say, let's direct and go? No, but if they're applied poorly, that's sin, right? If you start to run over people, that's sin. When you don't care for people, that's sin. This is just the way I'm made, so you have to love me. Sorry. (laughs) But we are called, no matter what area of leadership you end up being in, inside of a church, you must be a servant, So that means you are serving those who are in need. That means you are part of a church and you are coming alongside others to serve them. Very, very easy ways to see this within our churches. Sunday morning setup. You know what time we get here? About 7 a.m. You want to come, you want to come hang out? Come hang out. It's awesome. And we're yawning and we're drinking some coffee and it's great. But we are serving together. This happens all the time. Pastor Travis had several men come out yesterday to help. We had to get our trailer taken care of, and he had several guys volunteer to come help him uh, take care of some other stuff so we could get it all on a U-Haul and then roll it up and roll it down. He did a great job organizing that, and we're thankful for those men who served that way. We, we, we also have these awesome opportunities back there, you know, where all, where all the little voices scream. I mean, you'll probably hear them in about 10 seconds. It happens every week, and we love it. We love the voices of our kids back there. It's awesome. We are so thankful that the Lord's given us kids here. Um, But hey, we could use your help serving back there. Leadership is characterized in the local church by servant, by servanthood. When we bring people up in front of you to help lead this church, we want you to understand that those people have passed some level of servanthood. That, that they are serving here, and it's not just we think they're cool or they're the most attractive looking or, or they have the best presence in front of others. Those things are important on some level, I guess. But the most important thing and the way that leadership happens within the local church, all Christian organizations, is servanthood. And here's the other thing. What businesses are starting to understand. I I just finished my doctorate in leadership. And what businesses are writing about and learning about is this very concept. That those who would be engaged in servant leadership 
are the ones who are rising to the top in, in terms of their, their large organizations, Fortune 500 companies. That those who would serve are becoming the better leaders. That doesn't mean they don't have any ambition. That doesn't mean they aren't strong leaders. That doesn't mean they aren't pushing forward or, or, or directional or visionary. It means that what they understand is that as they serve others, something sparks inside of those people that they're leading to want to go off and do more to accomplish more. So, hey, leader, whatever leadership area you might happen to be in, church, business, and let's not forget the home. Hey, dads, hey, moms, as you lead your home, serve your kids. Yeah, you've got to be directional, probably a little commanding every so often, right? You, you, you getting out the door in the morning, hey, I can't find my, my shoes. I found one shoe, can't find the other shoe. You got to do a little commanding to help that happen, but you also probably got to do a little serving to find that shoe so you can get out in the morning. You need to understand that leadership within the local church, within business, within the home, needs to be rooted in servanthood. And so as we look into what Titus has to say about specific elder requirements, Understand that, that inherent in all of this, as we look at Titus 1, is servanthood. As we look at leadership within church all over, is that it has to be rooted in servanthood. So let me, let me give you a little church polity lesson. Who loves the word polity? Anybody even know what it means? No, that's a, that's a seminary word that I learned, so sorry, I apologize. Polity just means government. This is how we rule. This, this is how the church is governed. So write this down. There are two offices in church. There are two offices in church. You're like, I thought there were a lot of offices, like preschool director. I thought there was children's coordinator. I thought there was executive pastor. No, there's two offices. There's deacons and there are elders. There are deacons and there are elders. The Lord has made the church very flexible in order to make it possible to be set up in any area. So in Africa, deacons and elders. In Pearland, Texas, deacons and elders. In Russia, deacons and elders. In England, deacons and elders. There are two offices that are engaged in, two offices that are important, and there are deacons and elders. And as we characterize deacons, we say this, they are servants who lead. So if we talk about deacons, we say that they are servants who lead. They are, they are men uh, who are leading well, and they are servants. Their leadership springs out of their service. You can find it rooted in Acts chapter 6. We aren't going to go there today, but Acts chapter 6 talks about the first deacons who are raised up within the local church in Jerusalem. And what happens in Acts chapter 6 is as these men are raised up in the local church in Jerusalem, they are men filled with the Holy Spirit, and they are about serving the widows and orphans. And that's what these men do. So a lot of what they're doing is they are administrating tasks. So deacons, deacons are servants who lead. City View's in the process of this as well. We have two deacon candidates right now. Their names are Ricky Torres and Chris Perrin. We are walking with them carefully through a process uh, that we are right now on hold with until we finish some of our elder stuff. But they are, they are in process. What, what happened for us is we started about January of 2015. Travis and I started praying through a list of men who might be good leaders at our church. We sat down with each of them and said, would you be willing to participate in a leadership development program? Some said yes, some said no. Uh, by the time we started, we had about 12 to 15 men who sat down with us on a monthly basis who would, uh, who would walk through this process with us for the express purpose of developing elders and deacons. And as we walked through this process, every three months we had a little stop where we said, let's evaluate. Where are we? Where are you? Do you feel called to this? Where, do you want to keep going? Some would drop off. Some would keep going. A lot, most of the times when people would drop off, it was just because, hey, I don't have time to help lead. I think this is important, but I can't, I can't commit the time to this. And we say, that's fantastic. Thank you for understanding that time is an important part of this, and you just can't lead if you're not involved, right? Does that make sense? And so as we've kept going, we started to find, all right, these men feel called to eldership, and we feel like they're called to eldership. And it's funny how God puts those two things together so that you feel, so that God brings unity to that decision. You know what I mean? And then these guys, we, we feel like you're called a deacon, and, and, and what do you think about that? And they say, yes, we feel like we're servants who lead, servants who lead. And what we say about elders is this, is that they are, they are leaders who serve. 
When we talk about elders, we, we want them to be understood that they are leaders who are serving. So they are involved in the leadership of the church. They are the ones, we'll get to what that means here uh, in a minute, but they are the ones helping to set the vision and push forward. But as they're setting the vision and pushing forward, they are serving as they go. I think a lot of times we end up getting messed up inside of churches where, where we think somehow that the one who's the most powerful speaker, the one who can stand up in front and says, this is the way we're going to go, let's do it, is the one we should always follow. Here's the problem. What happens if that person is an idiot? Anybody ever see a senior pastor be an idiot? I have. I've seen it in the mirror. It is healthy for churches to have multiple elders who are of equal voice. And as we talk about this, I want you to understand right now we already operate in this way. If there's a vote that, tra- that we have to make a decision on, Travis and I vote equal, and his vote counts equal to my vote. I am not any more important than Travis is in terms of the way this church is governed because he is an elder of equal weight. I am the lead pastor, so it's my job to kind of set the vision and the direction. I'm the, one who's, I'm the one who says this is the agenda, and he comes along and approves that. Does that make sense? And as we walk forward with other elders, this is the way we'll continue to do this, that there will be a lead pastor, and I will continue to push forward but these men will come around and, and agree, disagree, and when it comes to vote, guess what? Jason doesn't get six votes. Too bad, huh? Jason gets one vote. Um, let's keep rolling. We have three elder candidates, and they've preached for you two have preached already. Uh, one of them is David Morton. He, he preached uh, and did a fantastic job our first week. Daryl Berry, who's in the back directing our service today, he's one of our other elder candidates. And next Sunday, Alan Johnson is going to be uh, preaching for us, and he is our third elder candidate. All these men have gone through all this training with us already, and will continue to go through training throughout the rest of this year. So these men are good men, strong men, love the Bible, love the Lord. And as far as we can tell meet the standards that, are, that we're about to read through. Here's what elders do at City View Church, though. Number one, elders are in charge of doctrine. Elders are in charge of doctrine. What does that mean? It means that we are going to take the lead role in the teaching areas. Does this mean that we will do all the teaching? No, it does not mean we'll do all the teaching. We are going to Talented people who want to teach kids are going to teach kids. Who are gifted to teach kids are going to teach kids. They'll do so under Pastor Travis's purview, and he will, he will help them prepare and get ready. But that is open to all. Uh, will, will they be the only ones who preach on Sundays? No, because what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to have church planters uh, on staff with us who are going to come through, and we're going to give them lots of chances to preach because we want them to prep and go, be ready to go out. But... The elders will be preaching on Sundays on on some occasions. We will also have them teaching our next step class. We'll have them teaching our new members class. We want to make sure that these men are engaged in the life of the church and are teaching well. Now, they're also going to be teaching good doctrine. So you'll see this in a minute, but this is an important part of what elders do, is that they have to love the word, they have to care deeply for the word, and they have to be able to encourage people in it, and rebuke people when they aren't walking according to it. So elders will set doctrine. Elders will also do one other difficult thing. They will do discipline. This is something that a lot of churches just will not do, is that when there's issues within a church, elders, pastors, deacons, They don't step up and deal with those issues within a church. I want you to hear right now that's not the way City View Church is going to be run. We are going to confront issues when we are aware of issues. Does that make sense? When there's sin issues within a church, we're going to take careful care to walk according to the biblical pattern that we are supposed to take. It's laid out for us in Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is a a chapter that is very much about the, the role of discipline within the local church. We're not going to get into it today, but it has essentially three phases. One of them is that, we, is that discipline begins with going person to person, 
sharing the sin that you felt sinned against or the sin that someone may have sinned against you or you may have sinned against them, that you would do that thing. The second part is if that doesn't work, if you don't gain your brother back, if that doesn't come back, if if they don't repent, then the second issue is, hey, uh, let's get an elder and let's get a little more official view of this as we walk forward. And then third, if, if the person won't repent and if there's no recovery of that soul, and what Matthew 18 says is that we would bring it to the church and we would say we need to treat that person like a non-believer. And that doesn't mean that we shun them. Like I've been in a church where what, we, what happened when there was church discipline enacted is they were shunned. You know, have you ever seen the office where shun wall goes up? Shun wall. That's my vision of this. Thanks, Dwight Schrute. Um, that's not the issue. No, the issue is when, when, that, when you get to that point, what, what do you do with someone who doesn't believe? You share the gospel with them, right? And you keep sharing the gospel with them until they might repent and believe. And that's the hope. The, 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 the hope isn't to turn someone off and, and say, sayonara, we hate you. No, the issue of church discipline and the issue that the elders have to keep at heart is the restoration of brothers and sisters who would stray. And that's the desire. And so City View Church is going to be a church where elders are going to set doctrine and work through doctrine, where elders are going to deal with discipline and deal with it biblically, according to the scripture and in light of the gospel, trying to draw people back to the scripture and to the gospel and to the body. And number three, elders will set direction. It's awesome how they all start with D, isn't it? Direction is just the vision. This is the fun part for elders. They get, they get to start thinking about where, is, where are we going to go and what are we going to do? Part of this is right now how we're, how we're Travis and I are working with our board and, uh, and our finance team to, to find land. And you guys can pray. We've put an offer in on a piece of property. Um, I can give you a little more details later. I don't really want to do that right now. We've put in lots of offers before, and so I don't want to get your hopes up. Like, we put in offers, and then we go back and forth, and it doesn't go well, and we, so we just, you know, go to the next thing. But I want you to know there's offers in. Uh, we are currently evaluating a couple properties, something that Travis and I have worked with our board on and our finance team is approved of, and now we're walking forward trying to find some properties. So, hey, good news. But they also get to set the other parts of the direction, like, How are we going to plant churches? How are we going to disciple individuals? How is that going to happen? And so one of the things we want to do is help help them, well, use them to spread leadership so that the leadership isn't just on Travis and I or what other staff members might come on, but that the leadership falls on their shoulders as well. Because in a plurality, then there's a lot of men who are loving the word, loving scripture, trained in it, caring for people, leading, and there are avenues to conversation and growth that, frankly, I only have so many channels that I can be reached on. And I can only deal with so many issues at a time. But if there's multiple elders spread abroad who have equal weight and equal voice, then those men are able to speak into those issues just as presently as I can. Does that make sense? Okay, moving on. Now we're going to start teaching, all right? Um, Titus 1. If you have your Bibles, go to Titus 1. What you're going to find in Titus 1 is the explanation of what pastors, elders are supposed to be within a local church. A very similar list will be found in 1 Timothy 3. Inside of these lists, what you're going to see is the qualifications for men who will lead. What this means is uh, th- there's essentially three categories, and, we're g- and inside those three categories, there are little individual aspects of each one. We chose Titus because uh, we can't teach on both of them at the same time, so there you go. Titus is a pastor. Paul has planted him in Crete, which is an island, and, and, and he said, hey, what I want you to do, Titus, is go throughout all this land, and I want you to appoint elders in every city so that these elders can help grow the church so these elders can help uh, set direction. So if you have your Bibles, look at verse 5 with me. Mm, There we go. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders 
excuse me, in every town as I directed you. Verse 6, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So here we go. Number one, write it down. The categories here, the family must be above reproach. The family must be above reproach. What does that mean? What's above reproach? Well, it does not mean that the family is going to be perfect. In fact, this word doesn't mean perfect. What it means is that, that this person is not open to some sort of terrible charge against them and their family. Does that make sense? That, that this, this man is not open to a charge of, of some sort of preposterous thing or some sort of crazy sin issue. You have to be above reproach, and you have to be the husband of one wife. So, does, number, so number one, this, this eliminates all polygamists. Sorry, polygamists cannot be pastors within a local uh, Christian church. Uh, I just had some things run through my head that I didn't say out loud, and I'm proud of myself for not saying them out loud, okay? Um, you can't do that. Uh, it also, what it also rules out is no serial divorcees. So a man who's going from woman to woman to woman, I'm going to marry her, divorce her, marry her, divorce her, marry her, divorce her, throws that out. Because the way the Greek is constructed, and the New Testament's written in Greek, and I hardly ever say that, but I just want you to know that, the way this word is constructed is that it is the one woman man, that an elder needs to be a one-woman man. So let me ask you this. Well, let me tell you this, and I'll ask rhetorically. Uh, do, does this push aside men who have been divorced pre-salvation, post-salvation, biblically, but then have been called to eldership later, call, trusted Christ later, and then they are now men who have been remarried and have been with the same wife, woman, for 10, 15 years. No, it does not preclude them. Why? Because they have demonstrated in their hearts and in their, in their souls, the way we would understand the scriptures, they are one woman men. It does not mean that if you've ever been divorced that you cannot serve as an elder. That do, it's not what that means. It means that we need to look carefully at the circumstance, understand why this happened, what happened, and we need to walk forward carefully with it. Does it preclude men whose wives have been who whose wives have died? They were married once and now they're married again. Oh, they can't be one woman men like that. No, not at all. Because they were one woman men before the death, and now they are one, if they get remarried, then they are one woman men after that. So our desire is to find men who are stable and are showing character in the way that they deal with the most intimate person in their lives. Does that make sense? That character in this regard and in leadership in general matters immensely. So everybody was thinking about politics. Let's just set that aside, okay? We're not talking about that. We're talking about church, all right? Character inside of leadership matters immensely. Inside of church leadership matters to the nth degree because we have to teach things like Ephesians 5 that says we have to love our wives like Christ loved the church and give himself up for it. Ooh. Well, if you're not loving your wife like that, then you're going to teach that in hypocrisy and that's not going to be good for the church to hear. So the men who lead, who are going to be elder candidates, who are going to be elders within the local church, the way leadership is set up here, is that they must be above reproach. They have to be the husband of one wife. They have to be a one-woman man. So we want to see stability in the way that they deal with their wives. Number two, uh, children are believers. Let me give you a little... Uh, do you love the Greek lessons? I don't know. Probably not, but you just have to have them. This was part of my dissertation, by the way, so you're welcome. Uh, I, I had to use this sometime. Uh, 
believers. What that word believers mean, what it really translates to the word that means faithful. So if you have a three-year-old child, does that three-year-old child need to be a believer? No. What, what, me, what it means is that three-year-old child has to be following mom and dad, has to be in obedience to mom and dad. Same thing with a five-year-old, because you can't force on a young child belief. Hey, you better believe, kid. If you don't believe, you're in big trouble. No. We, I mean, I have a three-year-old and I have a five-year-old. The five-year-old is, we call him a little preacher man blaze, because every so often he'll just bring up, come up like this crazy like gospel conversation, like, hey, dad, why did God create the world? I'm like, to bring glory to himself. And then he'll fire back with some other question. I'm like, Man, you're brilliant. And then Allie's like, you know, he's just trying to stay up later, right? <laughs> and they know that, like, they know, like, dad will let me stay up later if I ask him a Bible question. <laughs> the, the, this is a well known fact among my children. And so Judd tries and he just says something nonsensical, and we're like, all right, buddy, we love you. Go to bed. <laughs> The child doesn't need to believe. They need to be faithful. Now, they, as they get to a point, teenagers is when we really need to start thinking about some of this rest, the rest of this verse where it says, uh, must be above reproach. He must not, uh, I'm sorry. And his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery and subordination. They need to be faithful in that they're following mom and dad and to be listening, and they can't be open to this charge of like open drunkenness, and that they are m- massively flying outside the window of, of obedience to mom and dad. An elder has to have his house in order. Let me say that. Let me say it like that. We have to manage our homes well. We have to be prepared. We have to deal with things that fly up and come up, like we just had to replace an air conditioner. That was fantastic. Love that. The Lord was good to us. We were able to save for it in advance. So thank you, God, not where where we wanted that money to go. You know what I mean? Uh, But he was good to us and and gracious in that. Men who want to lead in church need to manage their homes well. Number two, uh, they need to have character that is above reproach. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So, above reproach. This is just another, uh, another way to like set this up. So, it was above reproach, family, and now above reproach in terms of your character. And there are, six, there are five things that you can't be. You can't be an arrogant person, which means you can't be a prideful, selfish person. These cannot be character, characteristics of your life. You cannot be all about yourself, and you cannot be pushing to get stuff for yourself. Second is you're, you can't be quick-tempered. So uh, this was an issue for me as a child. As a, young, as a young man, I was quick-tempered. I said things all the time as a young man, and by the grace of God, God has changed that in me and continues to change it in me. But this cannot be a typical thing that's characterized by leadership within church because, hey, guess what? We hear things all the time, and if, we get, if we're quick-tempered, then we're screaming at people in the middle, and that's not a good thing, right? You don't want to be screamed at, probably. You want to be prayed for. Not quick-tempered. Not a drunkard. So I think that's probably, like, obvious. Like, you don't want a drunk pastor, right? I mean, is that, are we, are you, uh, agree? Okay. That's like the easy, like, okay, I get that one. Um, not violent. So after church, I'm not punching people in the hallway, right? <laughs> Pastor Travis isn't, you know, drop kicking someone. Um, and what the idea is, is we're not quick to go this direction. We're not quick to fight. That's not maturity. That's immaturity. Uh, not great. So, hey, guess what? The church isn't the place to make money. Duh. Nonprofit organizations, tons of benefit. No, not really. Thankful for City View. They, do, they take care of our family well, and we're blessed by it. Um, however, we're not going to be getting rich off a, off a salary from a church. That's just not going to be what it's going to be about, and that's why we have a finance team that oversees those things. Not greedy. Also, they must be hospitable. 
So you got to care for others. They have to be lovers of good. These are six things that they have to be. They have to love good. They have to be self-controlled. And this kind of talks to the inner thought life, like how, how we think through things and how we deal with things. They have to be upright. So this thought life has to translate into action. So what's going on up here has to come out in the way we act out here. So our thought life has to be pure, and then our actions need to walk purely as well. Uh, they have to be holy, which doesn't mean that we have to be perfect. You know, we aren't spraying holy water out here, okay? What we're doing is we're, they have to be separated unto God, that this is something specific that God has called them to. And this is, and the last one is disciplined. Oh, discipline's hard. This means that you need to be disciplined in the way you go about your day and the way you deal with your appetites, the way you deal with your things. You must be disciplined. This is part of leadership in the local church in terms of personality. Number three, uh, they need to have doctrine that's above reproach. Look at verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. This trustworthy word is the scripture, the Bible that's been given to us, the Bible that we say is perfect and inerrant and, with, and without error in the original manuscripts. These things, this is the perfect word of God and we love it. And an elder must love it and hold close to it so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. So they've got to love the word so they can teach it well. They have to love the word so they can teach it well. And then they also have to love the word so that they can rebuke. When someone's walking out of step with the scripture, so that they can come alongside and rebuke when there are problems that are incongruent to the gospel, that are expressly against God's word. Let me tell you, this is not a pleasant conversation to have. However, men who stand as elders need to stand in courage and strength, understand that they aren't there to please someone else, but they're there to please the Lord and live according to the scripture, to set direction in something that is difficult for, for many, but to say, here's the Bible, here's what it says, now we need to walk forward and do exactly what it says. And the biggest thing here, as you think about servanthood and the way these men are called to lead and the way these men are called to act, is what is inherent here is they are to be humble. Is that the way elders and pastors need to live, need to walk, need to act in front of others is in humility. I will be the first to say that I struggle here but I want to be a man not who is humble, but is growing in humility. It is not a thing I'm perfect in, and I ask people to call me on all their time. I have accountability partners who are told that they must tell me when they see me walking out of step with this. And they do, and I hate that conversation a lot. <laughs> but humility is important to say that it's not me that matters, but it is the Lord who matters. It is not about me and my vision for where this church should go, but what the Lord wants from this place. And all leaders within church must walk as servants. In order to walk as servants, not as hypocrites, is that they must walk in humility, understanding that Jesus came in humility. I've been doing my devotions through Philippians, 2, through Philippians lately, and I just hit Philippians chapter 2. And it it talks about how Jesus came. And when he came, he, he came under the sentence of death and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That this man who was highly exalted in heaven came low. That's our example. That if we're going to lead, then we have to understand that we must be last business leader, if you want to lead well inside of your organization, you need to understand that you need that leaders eat last, to paraphrase a book title by Simon Sinek, which I would highly recommend. Dads. Just for a second with the dads. Husbands. If you're going to lead your families well, if you're going to lead those families well, then lead in servanthood and humility you will win. You may not win immediately, 
but you will win eventually. You may not win the little battles, but you'll win the war. Walk in humility, dads. Walk in humility, husbands.